You have to understand the context of that time. That time was filled with a lot of political uproar and a lot of conflict. It was a divided society and people were trying to look for a way forward. As a student growing up in that era, I wanted to participate in social change. I wanted to be part of it. But a great deal of the question was, how can someone who's just a student be part of something as big as national change? And I found my niche in filmmaking. Uh, it turns out that very few were involved in what they called alternative media. School of thumb was everybody was flocking to mainstream media because that's where the money is, that's where the recognition is, and very few were really actively involved in alternative media. So that's where I found my niche. And I started with filmmaking because it was uh, closest to my heart. There are other ways of participating, like as writers and as, you know, but I, I found filmmaking as something that video as something that spoke to me, to my heart. So that's how I started. Um, so your first film was De Luyon. Yeah, the Luyon, not my first film, but it was my first documentary about social ferment that was going on. It was uh, very difficult to make because it involves a lot of logistics, no? logistical questions had to be addressed, like transportation, food for the crew, money for film stock and for development and editing and so on. We were very fortunate because Mobile Fund loaned us the equipment for free. And the director of Mobile Fund, Surf Reyes, even offered, uh, offered the use of his house for editing, for editing purposes. And then a lot of filmmakers, some of them from abroad, even contributed film stock to help. So we were very fortunate that we were able to be part of that historic event. Can, can you talk a little bit more about the, the, the political context of the march? This is 1984 and there's a boycott effort the main mechanism by which democracy renews itself is through elections. So unfortunately, at that time, elections were, it's a, the election process was corrupted by the dictatorship. It was no longer an avenue for genuine change. It was merely a way of soothing people's fears and people's anxieties and people's anger. It was more of a way of whitewashing what was happening at that time. So a lot of mainstream politicians saw through that charade and issued that call not to participate in the pambatasang elections. So that's the context of the march. It was a way of announcing to the grassroots that we should not participate in this mock election. And of course, you were, you were eager to play a, a sort of a role as a video maker, a filmmaker at, at this time. Yeah, because again, I don't think it was covered by mainstream media. So, you know, it was happening. That was, it was something that is significant and important, but it was not part of mainstream media. And for a lot of people whose only source of information is mainstream media, if it's not covered by mainstream media, then it did not happen. So you have to look for alternative ways of bringing the news to the people. And that was, I thought, something that we should do and we could do it. Uh, was, um... You, you were do doing the documentation independently or were you with, uh, was it CAVS or Asia Visions who was no, no, coordinating? I was, I was a student at that time, so oh, okay. I was doing it independently. Mm -hmm. And as far as the actual boycott goes, I think um, the Oak Nose group, um, whose name I'm blanking on right now, um, what's the name of the Oak Nose group? Unido participated. Unido and PDP Laban also. Yeah, uh, PDP, PDP Laban. And I think, I, I don't remember now, but they got 13, 20 seats or something out of 100 something. Was there a, a was a, the boycott deemed a success or a failure because only some groups? Uh, I guess the, uh, the final assessment of that is mixed. So some people would say that the boycott succeeded in that it robbed the elections of its legitimacy. But others were saying people from uh, the politicians from the KBL were able to officially get the reins of power because the uh, majority of uh, credible politicians uh, abdicated from running in the elections. So it's a mixed uh, assessment. In terms of you, uh, your perspective, did you, um, did you, did you see the, the kind of granular politics as pertinent to the, the video work that you were doing? 
that was that. yeah that was something that concerned me as a citizen but as a filmmaker who was uh, who was uh, concerned with capturing the uh, the color and the passion and the and the tears and the sweat of the march it didn't concern me at that time but as a citizen of course i was concerned with the large picture is this an effective way of transforming society is this really just handing power over to corrupt politicians who runs regardless of whether it's legitimate or not so those are questions that uh, boggle the mind but as a filmmaker at that time i was just concerned in projecting the event capturing the event and sh showing it to other people it's uh you know it's a the Lo young is a beautiful film it's got a really sophisticated editing style and the shooting is really tight um just comparing it to um there is another film the lock by in i think 84 it's a much more kind of sophisticated filmic work um are you are you happy with the results still or do you feel like the some like the big picture politics were not uh necessarily mirrored or in in the film i i saw the luyo also about a few months ago for the first time after decades and I was really touched by the power of the storytelling. So on that level, I'm very satisfied. Your next question was on whether I see it now from the context of social transformation and whether it was effective or not. I think it is important that we document the people's struggle for social transformation. The pronouncements on whether they're effective or not should be left to history and to other people. But as people who are oppressed and marginalized and experimenting on forms, popular forms of uh, transforming or efforts to transform the society, I think we should go ahead and do it. In terms of the approach towards filmmaking, independent approach, uh, trying to document um, or develop new forms to document or mediate or uh, represent a uh, political struggle. Um, I guess Asia Visions is a group that kind of comes out and consolidates some of the uh, work that's going on in this front. Yeah. And um, and then later on, Alter Horizons. Can you talk about, first of all, your, um, your work with Asia Visions? Yes, uh, my work at Asia Visions and Alter Horizons, my main role there was as a cameraman. Sometimes I was involved in um, the development of the story, but most of the time it was just, uh, it was purely technical work. With Asia Vision, uh, with Alter Horizons, it was, I was given more latitude and because it was a cooperative, so it was more of a collective style of filmmaking. So there were a lot of freeform discussions on how to approach stuff and all of that. Can you say a bit, a bit more about how the, the press was really controlled uh, at this time? Well, there's the subtle way of controlling the press, which is uh, through economics. So uh, a lot of mainstream media are actually big business. And so the bottom line there is really what makes money. So there is this push for sensationalism. There's push for covering stories that they deem as commercially viable and interesting, and they are speaking to the ruling, uh, to the ruling elite, to the consciousness of uh, the ruling elite. But there's also a more direct authoritarian way of controlling the press, which is intimidation, locking people up, shooting uh, journalists, and so on. Both of these happened during that time and are happening even today. You mentioned that there. Um... <clears throat> There wasn't, uh, because of the way that there was a, a lockdown on what the press or the broadcast media was able to actually publish, there wasn't uh, really space for uh, a, a political counterforce to develop. The key role of media, I think, is to broaden the mind of the viewers or the consumers. So it needs a lot of analysis and investigation and so on, which is time consuming and very uh, expensive thing to do. No? So a lot of media organizations do what they think is the next best thing to providing investigative journalism, which is to provide news with a slant of entertainment. And that is terrible because a lot of majority of the Philippines get their view of, uh, get the macro picture, politics, economics, etc., from news, from television uh, broadcasts. And when media abdicates from their role as gatekeepers of uh, analysis, gatekeepers of critical consciousness, then what happens to all the other people? They have, the, most Filipino people would be hard-pressed to read analysis and books 
so they default to the cooler medium, which is video and news, right? It's much easier to consume. So that's the main problem of what happens. When mass media refuses to do this, no one else steps up to be able to do, to provide the people with that holistic perspective that would allow them to understand the intricacies of politics, economics, and sociology, and so on, that are really the engines of social development. So these engines are taken over by the uh, people in power and by the rich because they have the resources and they have the interest and the will to be able to, they benefit most by uh, controlling this uh, avenue of information. And uh, I guess you could say that in this period, in the, in the martial law period and the early 80s, even after martial law was supposedly lifted, uh, there still seems to be a kind of a vacuum about what ideas are uh, available for people to think about and make sense of politics. And um, the idea of there being some sort of, um, uh, I think you, you said last time, uh, no counterforce, that in the, what, what sort of stepped into the vacuum and became more yeah. dominant was the underground perspective, the Marxist perspective. What was obvious was that there is a government that was not respectful of human rights, that was robbing the people of its patrimony and its resources, uh, that was corrupt and was corrupting all the other institutions. That was obvious. But because there was no intellectual ferment on how to deal with this, then by default, the mass movement, the National Democratic Front and the Communist Party of the Philippines became the spokesperson of what, what to do given this situation, because they have been for many, many decades, they have been involved in armed struggle to uh, remove this dictatorship. So absent any other ways of dealing with uh, removing this kind of dictatorship, their argument became the, by de facto, the only argument. So at that time, I think the, the way the people articulated it is that it's the Communist Party of the Philippines approach is the only al alternative. So it's a TINA. There is no alternative other than armed revolution. You, you characterized it as a, um, like a conflict theory of social change. Can you describe more about what you, what you, what you mean by that? The basics of the theoretical framework of the movement was well articulated by mainstream media and alternative media. I mean, the most basics of it, which is that uh, revolutionaries make revolution. <laughs> that the, the main purpose of uh, the Communist Party is to make revolution, to transform the system from the ground up. I think that was very clear. And the strategy is armed struggle. That was very clear. It was well articulated by mainstream as well as alternative media. But the process of transformation and the, the nuance, the gray areas were not that explored. Why? Because of the limitations of consciousness, I think, of uh, most media practitioners. Most media, mainstream media practitioners didn't even know which questions to ask. Because, you know, if you're part of mainstream media, your consciousness is determined by big corporations, by the interests of big media. So you were into that. So you didn't even know what to ask. <laughs> and also the alternative media who were highly steeped in the, or were partisans in the Marxist perspective, couldn't even go outside that wall and ask questions that might be deemed as uh, heretical. So that was the main problem. And there was no avenue for discussions. You were afraid to ask because there were forces that were would go down on you if they hear you making noise and so on. And you were afraid to ask if you're part of the movement because it might expose your ignorance. Or you were afraid to ask before because you might be labeled heretical, a heretic. So all of that conspires to drive discussion under, uh, underground. So there were discussions among friends, but it wasn't really. That's why in, at that time, there were white papers that were written, unsigned and so on, <laughs> because it's a way of uh, voicing that kind of uh, sentiment that this should be an ongoing thing. It should not be nailed down. We shouldn't say that we've got it. We should be you know, intellectually curious and we should be honest to say, we don't know what's coming up next. It's interesting that a, a more mainstream figure uh, like Lino Broca, I, I think, was not uh, a, a communist, but maybe some might say, well, maybe he was a communist. But the, the fact that it would be obscure whether or not he was he had some sort of allegiance to the, the party would would, um, would 
it would seem to be uh, that there's a failure there to even take advantage of him as a public figure to articulate the goals of, of the of the movement, as it were. Yeah, and also because there was a great deal of baiting that, uh, that was going. Everybody who expressed pro people or pro poor uh, sentiments were labeled as communists. It's one of the one of the tactics of authoritarian regimes is to create a atmosphere of terror, and so that new voices and new ideas will will remain underground. So I don't think Dino Broca was a communist. I don't know him personally, but I've never heard him espouse revolution as a way of transforming society. I've never heard him and talk about, you know, control of resources to, so that it becomes the property of state and so on. How about the, the labor movement? Do you think that um, these films that I mentioned that came out in 1984, were they really reflective of a labor upsurge? Were they exaggerated? I think that labor then was more alive because uh, they have not, the, the ruling elites have not yet discovered or implemented the main formula of killing the labor union. So it was still alive because the main technique here in the Philippines at that time to repress the labor union was through violence. And when you do that, when you apply violence to labor unions, it expands <laughs> the labor unions, right? It energizes more people to take part in labor unions. So at that time, there was an active battle and nobody knew who would win, whether capital would win or labor would win. Because certainly the tone of the time was for labor. But now it's a different time altogether now capital has really succeeded but if you look at these films um yeah. there is never really a leap from uh trade unionism into politics but you have to consider that there was censorship at that time so filmmakers have to be able to say what they think is enough but not say too much so there's on the one hand self-censorship that was going on because this is a big business you spend millions to create it you want it shown so you have to self-censor to make sure that what is there is, uh, you know, vanilla flavored and would pass the censors. And then there's active censorship also. So, you know, you can't say that that much. There is a limit to what you can say. Well, let's let's get back then to talking more about the alternative films that you worked on. Um, did you want to talk about anything um, with um, that you did before Mendia, like before Edsa? Um, were there anything that really comes to mind? I shot a lot of documentaries with foreign film directors, and most of them were involved. They, they're very, they're passionate about people's stories from the countryside, about the different ways that uh, people struggle in with land. So I, I did a lot about Negros and the struggle there. I did a film on the NPA. I did a film on uh, political prisoners, about uh, alternative education and what people are doing and uh, cooperatives. So that was the sort of general flavor of we were doing at that time. Looking, looking back at it now and with, with hindsight, um, what do you think about the, I guess, and this is all with Age of Visions that you're talking about, the pre edsa uh, do, do you think that it was p politically successful? Do you have um, uh, a critique of the politics of the films that you were working on? What, what's your perspective in retrospect? I thought that it was as successful as it could be, given that there was no alternative means of disseminating the products. Not unlike today when you have YouTube and you know you just post it there and the world can access your work. At that time, it can. It was a very uh, good way of uh, showing your films. You know, you did that through NGOs and through partner communities and so on. So very limited viewing and. Uh, a very limited way of voicing the alternative consciousness and alternative efforts that you were witnessing on the ground. Do you want to talk a little bit more about who was watching it and how the films were distributed? They were copied in Betamax or VHS, and they were distributed to uh, all who cared to watch them. But primarily the main consumers are uh, organizations and community groups who were involved in those issues, and they want to, uh, to see what other communities are doing. So it's like uh, now, when you want to share best practices about what to do in this particular situation, what you can do is you can hold a workshop and then you can invite people and talk. You can't do that then because that would be organizing the poor <laughs> and you'd be labeled a communist. No? So a way of sharing new techniques, new ways, new approaches or best practices is through media productions. <laughs>
So they could have actually cracked down on what you were doing. I think they could have done that. But during that time, there were so many fires <laughs> at that time that they would they couldn't be bothered to you know raid a small group of uh, filmmakers making alternative films. They had much, much bigger problems <laughs> to contend with. Um, how about um, uh, Mandela Massacre? Um, for me, the film is, it kind of seems to mark um, it, or it sort of brackets at what seems to be a turning point in the political situation. Um, so I, I think it's an important historical document, actually. Can you talk more about your experience uh, working on that one? I was the cameraman of uh, Mendiola Massacre, and uh, I was right in front of the rally where the rallies meet the police force that was blocking the uh, way to Malacanang. So when violence ensued, I was one of the victims. I was shot twice in, uh, uh, during that time. I was shot in the head and I was shot in the stomach. And uh, the effect on me was uh, he affirmed my view that people in power have such low regard for the poor and the peasants. I think uh, for them, the poor and peasant farmers are objects, not subjects, not people. That experience just reaffirmed that view because of the way they treated the, the farmers then, because of the way that justice eluded the victims of Minjolo. But even for mainstream politics, it seems to be that if these were middle-class protesters who were massacred, it would have been a whole different level of... Different, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So even the uh, even mainstream politics was divided on how to respond to that. On the one hand, they saw footage of how there was a use of overwhelming force to control the rally, how people were chased into Quiapo by jeeps and firearms. And, you know, that goes <laughs> against, uh, uh, against any argument that it was to protect Malacanang and so on. But they, the, the voice was more muffled because it was about the peasants. Had it been middle class and rich people who were shot there, the outcry would have been heard around the world. But because they were just farmers, you know, it's very easy to really impose your will on them and forget about them. On the other hand, um, my understanding is that the organizers of the march provoked an altercation. This is what I heard later on. I was told that uh, Tadeo was, was ordered by higher organs or by his handlers to provoke confrontation. That is the sad part about it, because uh, this is not, this is human lives we're talking about, you know? And when you're doing that for an ideology or for an experiment or for uh, looking for a way to uh, accomplish your political ends, th that's not ethical for me at all, because people are involved. And, True enough, a lot of people died and a lot of people were shot because he followed, he allegedly followed that order. Um, what happened to you after being um, pers um, personally shot? Um, did you have to stop making films at that point? Uh, it took me about about a year to recover from my wounds in uh, Angola. So for that period, I stopped and uh, I went into a lot of uh, you know soul searching about uh, what I'm doing with my life. After that, I joined up with uh, Alternative Horizons, and we continue to make uh, pro people uh, documentaries. Sure. There's the moment when you drop the camera, and the editor of the final version of the video chooses to leave that in and you see the camera upside down. For me, it was almost like a metaphor for how the world has turned upside down. Uh, watching that film, I, I know you said you didn't work on the editing, but watching it later, what were your impressions? It was very difficult for me to watch it. I think I watched it after six months or seven months, and I only saw it once because it's so hard for me to, to watch it. Uh, it brings back the, uh, the trauma of the event. In fact, when I first went to Mindiola, it was a terrifying experience for me. When I went back and there was a rally, I had cold sweat and I was, uh, you know, palpitating and so on. So it was, it was really a traumatic event for me. Was Alter Horizons a change of pace, change in ideology even from working with Asia Visions? No, no, I, don't. I think it's, the, it's coming from the same sympathies and same uh, political perspectives as, uh, I mean, the two of them are. What was different was that uh, Asia Vision is a cooperative. So there was more of a group process involved. There was more discussions and there was argumentation and uh, debates and so on. For me, I find that refreshing. 
when there's uh, that dynamic. Could you explain more about the creative process with Alter Horizons? Uh, how did filmmaking work within that system? Well, there's a sit down and then there's a talk about when you do a documentary, it's not like you're doing a narrative film where you can script everything from the beginning to the end. So you talk about in a documentary, you talk about objectives, you talk about possible scenes that you'll be able to capture and you talk about how you want to put the different threads of the different stories together. So that's the creative process of filmmaking. A lot of what you discuss on the table will is not considered as written and stone because when you go to the field sometimes you find out that your imagination is so different from what is actually happening so you should have the humility to be able to say all we planned is wrong <laughs> all this shooting script that we did is wrong all the research we did is wrong and we go with what is there so in documentary filmmaking you become more sensitive and more open to what is really in front of you and you have to be able to step back from your initial conceptual bias or uh, your initial view of how this is going to play out. Uh, do you have any interesting stories about working with Bobby Roldan or, or Jacua? Uh, uh, revelations um, about the filmmaking process that happened as a result of this partnership? What I do is I uh, sit down with the person and then go, what like like what you did, we go through the story first and then I ask questions. I leave that uh, unrecorded. I do that because I think most people are not able to connect the dots in a way that is demanded by documentaries because documentaries are so hard on sound bites. It has to be succinct uh, statements that capture everything. So when you're going into a... a, a first interview, second interview, people most of the time are not able to link it together and say it in a way that is, uh, that is uh, loved by the camera and by uh, documentaries. So I don't do that. I, I normally just have a sit down, and we talk about it. And then I, through my questions, I help him clarify to himself what he's trying to say. What was the, um, I guess for you, the, the larger impact of alternative media leading up to, to Edsa. There's this book called The War of the Flea, where, you know, big dog, small flea, but by irritating the <laughs> dog, you know, in ways that, uh, you know, you, you make the, the big dog uncomfortable. You are not able to kill the dog, but you make him uncomfortable. And so, you know, I think alternative media is like that. We're the flea. We ask questions and we show, we get a mirror and reflect it back on the uh, people in power and so on so that they are reminded that what they're doing is, uh, is illegal, is unethical, against the uh, values of uh, nationalism or, pop, uh, or democracy. So I think that's the only thing that we can do. We cannot drive the narrative. We cannot force institutions to transform themselves, but we make it difficult for them to stay in power. So what happened after EDSA? There's a vacuum in politics. There's a vacuum in alternative media. Okay. When EDSA happened, a lot of political actors were disillusioned because they thought that when Marcos went away, Philippine society would be uh, up to scratch and would repair itself magically. This was coming from a political perspective that was very childish in that it assumed that all of that was brought about by one man. They did not consider that, you know, what he did with others, with other traditional politicians and rich people was that they corrupted institutions. They changed cultural values. They enabled a culture of, what do you call that? Culture of impunity and so on. So when society did not right itself after Marcos left, people were so depressed and didn't know what else to do because their analysis was limited to the removal of one person. And how did that impact the alternative media? The impact of that was that uh, there was a culture of malaise that uh, overtook all the uh, struggling NGOs and alternative media organizations because we were all so aware that to come to that point involved 20 years of struggle. And that historical moment will come again probably after another 20 years of struggle. So we were so disappointed. But we were not surprised that EDSA resulted in the same unjust uh, setup 
because uh, that's the nature of power. And what happened was that it was turning the baton to other people in the same class who had the same intentions and so on. It wasn't a renewal of uh, politics. It was, you know, turning of the baton to other ruling classes, to other members of the ruling class. So meaning to say the, the general malaise was something that was infectious. It affected the, the alternative media. Oh, yeah, because uh, we were celebrated around the world. That at some moment was, you know, it influenced uh, South Africa. We were in the eyes of the media around the world. Unfortunately, when we sit down and say what has happened, we couldn't say that it was really a victory. So, no, there was a, what they call that, a great deal of dissonance between what was being celebrated and what was achieved. So... A lot of people just said, forget about this shit. I'm going to take care of my family. <laughs> I'm going to get a real job. <laughs> I'm going to, because you can't beat, beat the system. And you said that you weren't um, really that surprised about what happened at Mendiola Massacre. Yeah. Um, that, well, others may have had hopes for uh, Aquino's reform agenda. You, you didn't share those hopes. Why, why was that? Because Aquino was, uh, was president only because certain generals and people in power tolerated her presence, her presidency. And if she rocked the boat in a way that would rub against the interest of those ruling elites, she'd be gone. And she knew it. So I guess what you can say is that Aquino was able to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. That's how I would summarize her, her presidency. Mm. She was given an historical moment where she could have done anything. She could have changed the constitution in a way that would have granted, uh, uh, you know, tremendous other. reforms and so on. She could have repudiated the debts from other countries and so on. She could have done that, but she snatched <laughs> defeat from the jaws of victory. The irony for I guess, counter-public uh, films or alternative cinema or cinema with even alternative themes, like the labor themes, is that these films happen under Marcos. They happened under the tail end of martial law. And then you don't see anything else after it's uh, actually like, this, like these films. Also because the EU movement, the trade union movement fell. So, you know, <laughs> so that's the main problem also. The injustices that were created during Marcos's time are so sexy for sensational reporting. But when it's about rebuilding, you know, about a community trying to build dams and building cooperatives, mass media will not cover that. So those are the wonderful things that were happening and so on. But, you know, it's not, it won't sell papers. It won't uh, catch the eye of uh, advertisers. So yes, this is where Randy David calls these labor films aspirational. They weren't necessarily reflective of, a, uh, I guess, an actual politics, as it were. I think most of us are uh, more aspirational than... I think that there's a huge gap between our aspiration and what we've accomplished. And, you know, I just take it as it is. That's the reality of it. It's not to say that we should not have high aspirations. I think we should. But it's to impel us to reach higher, to try harder, to stand up when we fall. That's the purpose of aspiration. But we should be honest to say we made a mistake, we failed, we fell short. We should be honest about that. It's all about learning. A lot of people don't want questions and don't want to dwell on mistakes because they think it's a roadblock to success. Whereas anybody who's led a significant life know that failures are littered in the road to success. So it's important that you learn from your mistakes. And it's a major impediment if you call a defeat a victory. And I guess that's where alternative media has an ethic. There's an ethical imperative for it to not produce simply propaganda, but some there has to be some sort of probing and thinking and thought process too. As I said, that's the most important resource that a filmmaker brings, his capacity to be able to ask questions and to examine what is in front of his eyes. If you don't have that, then what kind of films are you going to produce and show?